and today we'll be talking about psychiatric disorders and then we'll follow that with case reviews. I'm going to start this presentation off with a video from West Palm Beach, Florida. Six seven out with the signal twenty six hundred block of Forty Fifth Street. What's up, buddy? White male, no shirt, possibly Lay down. Lay six seven out with the signal twenty six hundred block of Forty Fifth Street. What's up, buddy? White male, no shirt, possibly Lay down. Lay down. What's going on, bro? Who? How much coke you smoke, man? I don't do nothing. Oh, Lord. Hey, do me a favor. What? Relax. Please. Okay. I'll help you. Oh, my God. Hey, relax. I want nothing I'm sorry. Relax. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. I'm on the ground. Stay there. Hey, stay like that. Come here, boy. Oh, I'm right here. Stop. Oh. Stop. So I imagine that reminds you of some calls you've been on. And we're, today we're, we're going to talk about psychiatric disorders, and we're going to talk about the full range. Psychiatric disorders impact almost every call that we go on. Obviously, some, some are much more severe than others. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the key terminology for the psychiatric exam. We're going to talk about the new system for classifying psychiatric diagnoses. And uh, we'll hit the most important psychiatric diagnoses that we see on a daily basis. We're going to talk about what requires emergency evaluation. And then finally, we're going to talk about recognition and management of excited delirium. And we'll come back to this video. So first, we're going to talk about the psychiatric exam. So for a psychiatrist, this is like their physical exam. This is what they do every day, and they document it on every patient. Now, even in the emergency department, I'm not documenting every single thing on every single um, patient. But what you often find with psych patients is that there's one key thing that's really out of whack. And so this is just to give you some terminology to describe what you're finding with the psychiatric patient. So the psychiatrists describe a patient's appearance and behavior, their speech, their mood and their affect, the thought process, and content, insight and judgment, and then cognition. So appearance and behavior are pretty straightforward, but give you some important clues. This is essentially what you see when you walk through the door or you, uh, or you pull up and see this person on the side of the street. And so you can describe them as disheveled, well-kept. Um, often with psychiatric patients, you, uh, you may find you know, this person has um, has uh, colored their hair purple and um, made it stand three feet tall. Something like that that uh, can give you some insight into their uh, psychiatric state of mind. And then their behavior is what they're doing, whether they're agitated, pacing. You'll see patients picking at the skin or what we call responding to internal stimuli where they're uh, responding as if someone were talking to them, but no one's talking to them. Speech can be a little bit tricky to separate from thought, but we're just talking about the mechanics of the speech here, whether it's rapid, pressured, slow, soft, slow, or slurred. Um, what is, uh, how are they speaking? And then mood is the predominant emotion that a patient is experiencing. This is typically something that we'll ask a patient, you know, how do you feel today? And um, and then put their description in their own words. Affect is how the patient expresses emotion. So and you'll find that you often have a physical reaction to the way the patient is presenting. So normal affect is someone who 
shows you know some range in emotion. They can be happy about something, sad about something, but it, it feels normal to you. It doesn't feel like they're all over the charts. A really flat affect or blunted affect is someone who um, basically can't express any emotion. And you'll see this often with schizophrenia patients. It's just everything is kind of a monotone. It's that thousand yard stare. An expansive affect is someone who is just over the top, really excited. Everything is fantastic. I'm the president. I'm going to go meet Vladimir Putin tomorrow. Things are fantastic. And then labile is someone who swings back and forth between being really happy and being really sad. So thought process and content is the next step. The thought process is how the thoughts are organized. And you can almost think about this, like think about this as diagramming X's and O's on a football field. So a normal thought process is moving from one thought straight to the next, like these first two circles here. A tangential thought process is I'm talking about one thing and then I go off and talk about something completely unrelated and then I go off and talk about something unrelated to that. Or thought blocking is, um, where you just you can't just can't get on to the next stage. You're just fixed on something. You just can't move in a logical pattern. You get stuck. Loose associations are uh, um, you go to something and then something that's a little bit related and then something that's a little bit related to that. But as compared to someone that you'd be having a normal conversation with, it just feel it feels pretty all over the place. And then thought content is what the patient is thinking about. Um, so that's whether they have suicidal, homicidal ideations, whether they have delusions or hallucinations. And then insight and judgment are the next step. Insight is the patient's awareness of his problem and what it means. So, for example, if someone has, um, has just torn up, you know, gone over, torn up his mother's house, he's been placed on a mental health hold by the police, and he doesn't realize that his behavior is a problem. That's poor insight. Um, or someone may, you know, whereas someone who says, you know, I have, I have hallucinations, and someone's, you know, these voices are telling me to kill myself, and I don't want to do it. And I think that's a bad idea. That's, the person's got abnormal thought content, but he's got a good insight. He recognizes that he's got a mental illness and that this is a problem. And this is something in where we in the hospital are crucially dependent on the MS history. Because I can't tell you how many times, you know, someone will say, like, well, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I came home, I was, uh, I had been walking around the streets naked, um, but then I came home and I put on some clothes and then I started talking to my mother. And unless we have that pre-hospital history that, well, the guy actually was walking around the streets naked, we don't know if that part is true or not. So this is something where your history is really crucial for us figuring out what's going on. Judgment is the ability to make sound decisions about everyday activities. So, for example, someone who's manic, um, in the manic phase of a bipolar illness, may do things like smoke a bunch of cocaine, spend all their money, have sex with 30 people, and uh, we would call that impaired judgment because it puts them at risk. They're not making good decisions about their everyday activities. And then cognition is how their mind is functioning. And this is probably the biggest point of overlap. It's, uh, it's blocking the mouse. Yeah, I just can't. It's, uh, it's hiding the mouse. So this is a patient's orientation, which is something that we uh, almost always assess. Their attention and their memory, short term and long term. So with that in mind, I'm going to show a short video. This video was not nominated for any Oscars. Um, but just t take a second, pull out a piece of paper, and just write down how you describe this person's psychiatric exam. I want to be left alone, so leave me alone. Get out of here. Go. 
Get out of here. Stop watching me. I said stop watching me. Stop watching me, please. I just want to be left alone. Just leave me alone. Get out of here. I'm Sergeant Garrity. Who, who called you? What are you doing here? I'm not doing anything. Can we talk? Someone called and said you appeared to be upset. <laughs> You'd be upset, too, if you were monitored like me. I just want to be left alone. What's your name? What can I call you? I'm Bill. Bill, are you feeling okay today? I'm fine. Everyone just needs to leave me alone. I don't need people walking by and reporting on me. Bill, we're here to help you. Why don't you have a seat on the stairs over there and talk to me? Let me see what I can do. Just leave me alone. Any questions about that before we move on to the next topic? So we're going to talk about the classification of psychiatric illnesses. So the Bible, in terms of psychiatric diagnosis in the U.S., is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The first edition was published in 1952. Um, up until last year, we were using the DSM-4, which was published in 1994 and then revised in 2000. And then just, just under a year ago, the DSM-5 was published, and it went into effect on January 1st, 2014. And so there are a lot of things that are changing in psychiatric diagnosis as a result of this. And I'll point out the things that are relevant for emergency medicine and for EMS. So the major changes are that it removed the axial system of diagnosis. Now, as you can imagine, you can't just wave a wand and have something go away completely. So I'm still going to cover that, and you'll still hear those terms. But in terms of what, how psych, psychiatrists are coding their charts, how insurers are paying for diagnoses, um, the axes are, are now gone. There's some changes in the names and groupings that I'll bring up as we go through the specific diagnoses. So the reason for this, we have learned a lot about psychiatry since 1994, and so this reflects some of the new science. Where possible, the goal was to remove stigmatization of mental illness. And then finally, it's compliant with ICD-10. And if you really want to see a doc's eyes glaze over, just ask them, how are they enjoying implementing ICD-10? Uh, but that's a major change in the international classification of diseases that's also going into effect this year. And so it's changing the way we're coding a lot of things in the emergency department. So this is the multi axial diagnostic system. Uh, you'll still hear people refer to, especially Axis 1 and Axis 2 conditions, and so I want to review these things, uh, but this will gradually fade away. So Axis 1 are the primary mental disorders. These are things like depression, schizophrenia. Axis 2 are personality disorders, such as borderline personality disorder, and what was called mental retardation and is now called intellectual disability. Axis three are general medical conditions, like for example, heart disease, diabetes. Axis four are the psychosocial stressors. So you can imagine a patient with schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, and diabetes is in a very different situation if they live in a home, have a supportive family, uh, have plenty of funding sources, versus someone who is homeless, has poor coping skills, and so all of these things are taken together in what was called AXIS-5, which is the Global Assessment of Functioning. And it's essentially a zero through 100 scale, which grades how well someone is able to function in their daily life. Whereas someone who, um, for example, has depression and has some difficulty going to work for a little while might be in the 80s, um, but someone who is severely schizophrenic, unable to hold a job, unable to maintain an apartment, might have a score in the 20s, in the 20s or 30s. So what's replacing this? And so in the new system, axes, axes one, two, and three are combined. So this reflects that we think that personality disorders are now more, more related to the major mental illnesses, and they're no longer separated. 
and then they make notations for the psychosocial factors and how disabled they are by the condition. This is not something that you need to cover in your EMS charting. I've mentioned this mostly as background for what's changing in the whole world of psychiatry. Questions about that before we go into the specific diagnoses? So first we're gonna talk about mood disorders. So the most common mood disorder is major depressive disorder. The thing that I remind myself about this, there, there was a study once of men who had been through both open heart surgery and major depression, and about 90% of them said that they would rather go through open heart surgery again than to go through an episode of depression. It's a pervasive dysphoric mood that lasts at least two weeks. People have anhedonia where they don't enjoy the things that they normally enjoy, guilt, hopelessness, they can have suicidal thoughts. It's often associated with an underlying medical disorder. So for example, hypothyroidism can make you more prone to major, major depression and very commonly associated with substance abuse, which can make it more difficult to treat. But a primary mood disorder where depression is the major problem typically responds fairly well to antidepressants. Bipolar disorder, what was called manic depressive disorder, differs from major depressive disorder because there's also this manic phase where people feel elated or irritable. And so particularly during that manic phase, they feel a decreased need for sleep. They have racing thoughts, rapid or pressured speech. I'm just gonna minimize this. So they'll have delusions of grandeur. They think, I, I had a patient tell me the other day, I, I'm basically, I'm here for world peace. Like, that's, that's all I'm trying to do today. Um, and so this is managed, and, and as we discussed earlier, patients can do really dangerous things during this manic phase, and then during the depressive phase, they act like someone who, uh, who is depressed. Uh, this is managed with mood stabilizers most common of them, lithium and Depakote. The thing to note is that most mood stabilizers have a fairly narrow therapeutic window. So lithium in particular, any kind of kidney dysfunction, it's pretty easy to, um, to develop a toxic level. Depakote has a little bit wider therapeutic window, but people can still run into difficulty with, uh, with problems with uh, liver dysfunction on medications like that. Anxiety disorders are also very common and also a very common reason that EMS gets involved. So generalized anxiety disorder is someone who feels anxious about everything all the time and it lasts for greater than six months. It's treated with SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, medicines like Prozac, which are a long-term control for the anxiety and ben benzodiazepines for short activity, for short acting. And many of these, many of these people, um, the doctors pursue what's called a pill, pill in the pocket strategy, where they have a tab of Ativan or Xanax that they can take when they feel their panic disorder, um, when they feel their anxiety ramping up. The panic disorder is more episodic, where people can feel normal and then have these episodes of panic. And then one of the changes in the DSM-5 is that panic attack is now, can now be a feature of other disorders. So for example, you can have major depression with panic attacks, or you can have bipolar disorder with panic attacks. The most important thing when we contact them is to understand if they have a history of panic attacks. And, um, and these are people that generally respond well to uh, the dose of benzodiazepines. I think Versed is great for this because it's short acting because it's, uh, because it's rapid and onset for people who are significantly anxious, especially to the point that it impacts their treatment. 
So now we'll move on to schizophrenia and the psychotic disorders. These are problems with thought process and thought content. So a psychotic disorder is defined as something where there's impaired reality testing. I mean, they're not living in the same reality that you and I are. So they can have delusions, they can have hallucinations. By far and away the most common of the, psychiatric, of the psychotic disorders is schizophrenia. It usually appears in late adolescence or early adulthood, and there's a period of decreased functioning. And so, you know, sometimes, generally, it's rare before about 15 or 16, and it's rare to have onset um, much later than 27 or 28. But the family will describe this period where things are gradually getting worse, gradually getting worse, and then they have this psychotic break. Schizophrenia has both positive and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms aren't positive in that they're good, they're positive in that they're in addition to what uh, people who don't have schizophrenia have. So they have the addition of hallucinations, delusions, and then they have negative symptoms, which can be really, which can really negatively impact their life. So if disorganized thinking, poor judgment, poor associations, meaning it's tough to, um, tough to put a plan together, and then they have this flat or blunted affect. So I'm going to show another video of someone with schizophrenia, just make a little notation of what, what positive symptoms she's having and what negative symptoms she's having. Why don't you try to, what do we do us that I have a monopoly over the coffee industry? Okay, and so that's the problem, isn't it? That's the complaint, right? Well, uh, I have kryptonite in me. You know what that is, don't you? Kryptonite? And, uh... So if I have kryptonite in me and I drink coffee and soda, and no one else knows what to eat. I mean, do you live on raw eggs? Do you live on raw eggs? Do you eat raw eggs? When I was pregnant, I think boys get pregnant and girls don't. Yeah, it's true. But I eat raw eggs, but, uh... Do you eat raw eggs? No, what do you eat and drink? What's the, is that the pro big problem? You don't know what to keep you sane by? Is that a, is that a complaint? No? Okay. My daughter... So the treatment for schizophrenia is antipsychotics. They can be very effective for the positive symptoms. And you can see people who stay on their meds tend to have some control of the positive symptoms. They're less effective for the negative for the negative system symptoms, and so people with schizophrenia um, often have long-term difficulty with functioning because they're disorganized, because they have difficulty expressing emotion, coming up with a plan. So there are other psychotic psychotic disorders. Schizophrenia requires at least six months of psychosis to firmly make the diagnosis. So schizophreniform disorder is looks like schizophrenia. We just haven't reached the six months necessary to make the diagnosis yet. You can have mood disorder with psychotic features. So for example, someone can have bipolar disorder with psychosis associated with that. Schizoaffective disorder is where you have both the mood disorder and schizophrenia. Uh, so for example, you can have major depression and schizophrenia. Sometimes we come in contact with people who have brief psychotic disorder, which is usually after they experience a, a very traumatic event. They can have hallucinations as a, as a result of that. And then there are people who have delusional disorder, so they may have a fixed delusion. So they think that you know, my uh, my neighbor, my neighbor is spying on me. My neighbor is the is the devil, but uh, they're still able to. You know, they still go to work in the morning, come home. Their neighbor is still the devil, but they're getting their job done. Their activities of daily living are not impaired by a delusional disorder. 
Now we're gonna move on to cognitive disorders. So in the DSM-5, what, we, what we've called for a long time dementia is now called neurocognitive disorder. Dementia is an accepted alternative name. Again, this is realizing that you can't just snap your fingers and have every, everyone change their terminology. So you'll still hear dementia, it's still a perfectly accepted term, uh, both in the medical community and by insurers. But you'll, you may also hear the term neurocognitive disorder. So this is a disturbance of the cognitive functioning and it normally affects mostly memory and abstract thinking. So this can be, this is like someone with Alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia. They're almost always slow in onset. It can make an underlying medical illness more difficult to pick up. So I'm sure you've experienced it can be really difficult to get a history from someone with dementia. But there may be reversible causes, and so particularly if someone doesn't have an established diagnosis, we're going to work through all the potential medical causes that, uh, that could cause their altered cognition. Contrast this to delirium, which is a global impairment in cognitive functioning. So it's not just memory, but it's problems with orientation, um, problems with thought processing. They usually have a decreased level of consciousness. It's acute. There's often a fluctuation in severity. So for example, someone with delirium tremens from alcohol withdrawal um, can go from being fairly oriented to having hallucinations, um, not able to process, picking at their skin. And there are often abnormalities in the vital signs that go along with delirium. Now we're gonna talk about the neurodevelopmental disorders. So I mentioned before what was previously termed mental retardation and treated on access to is now called intellectual disability or intellectual development disorder. But you'll hear both terms in the pit. A, a parent may say, you know, my son has mental re retardation, my son has intellectual disability. Attention def deficit hyperactivity disorder um, is something that um, we, most of us know someone who's been diagnosed with. Many of them work as emergency physicians. But uh, there, this is definitely a concern in DSM-5 because they've made the criteria for diagnosis a little bit more liberal. And so there may be more diagnoses of these, particularly in children. And then another change in DSM-5 is that what was previously four separate disorders along the autism spectrum are now combined to be autism spectrum disorder. So it was autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, uh, childhood disintegrative disorder, pervasive, de pervasive developmental disorder. And so now these, these are, exist on a spectrum. These are people who have difficulty communicating, forming relationships, using language and abstract concepts. But there is a wide, wide range in how these patients present. And in general, dealing with this, the family is the best guide, because they'll, they'll understand whether, and they can explain whether this is just a mild dif difference in functioning, and they can give you some clues on how best to approach the patient and how to deal with the patient. But occasionally, you're gonna run into some patients that are wildly out of control with um, severe autism spectrum disorders that cause. So these two videos show the range. Uh, the first, uh, first patient is Nikki, who's a 19-year-old. Nikki's written a number of dictionaries like and also a novel called hobby. Dragon Law, which she was keen to show me. These two are Japanese books, which are my, which is my favorite language to learn. And I'm starting to write the entire alphabet in hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Do you speak Japanese? Yes. H how do you say hello? My name is Nikki. Konnichiwa, watashi wa nikuas. Very good. Next we have. German. Can we move on to Dragon Law? Oh. Not yet. Oh. Next we have um, Chinese Simplified. And last but not least, we have the Hindi language book. Hindi is a language that they speak in India. Oh. So you see, here's someone who's capable of doing certain things that most 19-year-olds and most 30-year-olds are not capable of doing. He, and even 
and even though autism often impacts language ability, this is something that he's focused on, and he's just, he wants to learn languages one after the other, after the other. Um, but they, um, on the on this end of the spectrum, they tend to be very interested in one thing in particular, and you can see he doesn't like to be redirected. He really wants to have control over his environment. So when the interviewer wants to move on to the next thing, he's very he's controlling. He says, "Not yet, not yet." Um, but he has great ability as a result of that. But you can see if you get someone like this with a medical emergency um, and he's in a situation that's unfamiliar to him, that can be a particularly stressful situation. Um, here is someone who uh, is 20 years old on the other end of the spectrum. It's like, this is where he's put his head through the wall, head through the wall. And this is where he stood and kicked it. spectrum disorder. Here the in the back now. So you can see people who are very impaired by severe autism spectrum disorder. The parents may be able to give you some clues as to what's going on with this, but if someone like this is out of control, you may be in a situation where you just need a lot of force and, um, and medications to sedate. We're going to run through some other psychiatric disorders. So we often see patients with substance use disorder, either intoxication, leading to maladaptive behavior, impaired judgment. The presentation of substance intoxication obviously depends on the substance. We see patients with withdrawal, both life-threatening withdrawal, as you would see with withdrawal from alcohol or benzodiazepines, and withdrawal that's miserable but not life-threatening, like withdrawal from opiates. And then you see dependence where people do maladaptive things to be able to get the drug. We come in contact with patients with eating disorders, um, particularly anorexia. The anorexia has a 10% mortality uh, over the course of a lifetime, higher than any other psychiatric disorder, because of the significant impairment you get in body functioning. Um, people are often very high achieving perfectionist, but they have, are highly controlled. They have this distorted attitude towards eating food and weight, a fear of fatness that's, um, that's out of proportion. I mean, they can have 5% body fat and still be very worried about that. Um, they, they will deny that they're emaciated. They often have excessive eating or exercising, and then when they trend into um, bulimia, they'll have binge eating and purging. So bulimia is defined as the binge and, the binge and purge. Um, patients often have uh, teeth disturbances because of the frequent vomiting. Um, they can have normal weight, but they can have dramatic fluctuations in weight. You can have electrolyte disturbance because of the frequent vomiting. And then the bad breath, hair loss, and muscle cramps. One note, patients with both bulimia and anorexia, um, when they have significant weight loss, they become very prone to fluid overload when we give them IV fluids. So these are patients you just want to be very gentle with IV fluids. So there are obsessive compulsive disorder and then some related disorders. Um, so obsessive compulsive disorder has repetitive thoughts and mannerisms. So for example, someone who washes his hands 10 times um, before, before he'll go to eat or needs to touch the door in this order and then turn the key that way before opening the door. And then obviously in EMS we come across a lot of people who are orders. 
and uh, and that can obviously make extrication difficult. Another change in the DSM-5 is that PTSD was taken away from the other anxiety disorders and made its own category. I mention this not because we frequently deal with patients who have PTSD, but it's not uncommon for our colleagues in EMS to deal with this, and so I wanted to spend a little extra time on it. The four criteria for diagnosing PTSD are re-experiencing the traumatic event, having heightened arousal, so this is the person who's walking down an aisle in Safeway, um, but still looking for the sniper that's behind the cereal, um, avoidance of something that could be potentially triggering of the traumatic uh, memory, and then negative thoughts and mood. Patients, you know, PTSD happens, it's post-traumatic and happens um, three to six months at least after the initial stress. Patients can also have acute stress disorder where they're unable to cope because of an acutely stressful event. Um, and I, I mean, I took, I took care of a patient the other day who uh, saw, you know, she was an apartment manager, came in and found someone who had, uh, had shot his head off. And, um, and you know, you, we get fairly used to things like that, but for her, this is the most awful thing she'd experienced in her whole life, and she was having a great deal of difficulty with, uh, with her daily functioning. So personality disorders are something that we often come in contact with. A personality disorder, it's a lifelong problem. You can manage it, you can try to make it better, but these are things that never go away completely. And these are personality traits that impede your daily functioning. Probably the one we come across most, con most frequently in EMS is borderline personality disorder. With someone who is, has a borderline personality, almost all of their behaviors are directed at efforts to avoid abandonment, whether that's real abandonment or perceived abandonment. And so they will do things like splitting. And so this is the patient that says, you are the most fantastic paramedic I've ever come across. Your partner is a total jerk. I hate him. Don't get him anywhere near me. Now, that may be true, but, um, but that's, not, that's an, a behavior that we'll often see in patients with borderline personality disorder. They tend to be very impulsive and have a current suicidal behavior. So these are common calls that we see for patients who make suicidal gestures, either cutting on themselves, taking uh, what's often a sublethal dose of medications. Um, the, the next four present kind of similarly, and these are patients who are just very, uh, very isolated. And often when we contact them in, in EMS, with, it may be the first contact they've had for some time. So obsessive compulsive personality disorder is just a slight variation on obsessive compulsive disorder where um, it doesn't completely impair their ability to live, but it can make them pretty difficult to live with or to get along with. Avoiding personality disorder from people who just, you know, they, they're unemployed, they won't, but they won't go to a job interview because they're afraid of rejection. Um, schizotypal has some of the features of schizophrenia, but not full-blown psychosis. Um, so they, they can be very blunted, very withdrawn. Antisocial personality disorder. Um, the, um, there are many people who are in prison, rightly so, because they've committed crimes, because they just feel no remorse, no, no bond to the rest of society. And narcissistic personality disorder are people who are just fascinated with how wonderful they are, how good they look, and, but the whole world revolves around that. And then we often come across, come across people with somatoform disorders. And these can, these can be difficult to deal with. These are symptoms for which a medical diagnosis cannot be established. So conversion disorder is something that we see. And it's, although occasionally patients will already have that diagnosis when you contact them, often you're seeing them for the first event in which this presents. So for example, um, I had a woman who all of a sudden like couldn't feel couldn't feel from her legs down, couldn't move her legs. And I mean she even like, like I poked 
of needles into her legs, like she wasn't feeling anything. But I did an MRI. That was total. That was totally normal. And so it's often an inability to walk or an inability to see. Um, patients are surprisingly unconcerned about it. Like, yeah, I can't walk. I can't. Do it. But and it's often after some kind of stressful event. But it's. You know, unless until you've had a full medical workup, it's really difficult to make this diagnosis. Uh, pain disorders are something that we see very frequently. Hypochondriasis is someone who is consistently convinced that they have a medical illness, and is separate from someone with a factitious disorder who um, is doing it for secondary gain. People, uh, someone who has hypochondriasis, they really believe that they are sick. Um, factitious disorder is uh, manufacturing something usually for some kind of secondary gain. So maling malingering is just the you know the person who takes an illness to try to get an ambulance ride to one part of town to another. Now, again, it can be difficult to make this diagnosis primarily. Drug-seeking behavior, something that we are uh, very familiar with. Munchausen syndrome is when someone is so interested in assuming the sick role, they will either feign or actually make themselves sick uh, in order to get medical attention. So for example, I, I took care of a patient in residency who, um, a, a guy in his mid-30s who complained of ripping, tearing chest pain on a flight. The flight was diverted to Denver. We were the closest hospital to the airport. Uh, you know, comes in code three, and he's got a zipper on his chest. Um, he's already had his chest open. And it turned out after a long workup that even the, the cardiothoracic surgeon had seen him in training on the East Coast. And this is someone who goes around to different hospitals. He has an, uh, an allergy to IV contrast dye. And um, he, he was so convincing in his presentation that once he actually got surgeons to open his chest, where they then found normal anatomy. Um, so. These can be these can be really difficult to pick up, uh, but this way, if you if you see that someone has the diagnosis of Munchausen syndrome, just know that that's a factitious disorder. The last one, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, is a parent who enjoys taking getting the caretaker role, and so they will either pretend or they will, in some cases will actually make their child ill, so they can be in that caretaker role. These are thankfully very rare. Uh, but can be pretty disturbing when you see. Right. Why don't we, let's take a five minute break now and then we'll move on to talk about excited delirium syndrome. So we're gonna get back started talking about excited delirium syndrome. And I'm gonna finish up the video that we saw right at the start. And so I'd ask you, as you're, um, as you're going through this, just watch this call. Think about where where this could be going. Um, what could potentially change the course of this call? Oh, Get on the ground. I'm on the ground. Oh, stay Lord. there. Hey, stay oh, like I'm that. Me. Come I'm here, dude. Hold on, my ass. Ow! Stop! Oh, Hold on, the cars are gonna. Oh, the fuck. Oh, Come here, dude. Sorry. Come here. 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 I'm sorry. Put your hand behind your back. Put your hand behind your back. Put your hand behind your back. Put your hand behind your back, dummy. Put your hands behind your back. Now! Put your hands behind your back! Ah, I'm 
Officer Shaw, I'm gonna help They're you. Alive. You gotta help me. You want your name? Hey, now. Yeah, we're just trying to uh, get him contained here. Hey. We're all right. Oh. Guys, we the, uh, the guy that just called in. Okay. No shirt. Oh, all right. Jump. How do you get think my shirt? You're alive. I didn't jump. Right, get your gloves on. No gloves. I'm off. Get off his ass. Get off his ass. Keep still. Ready? Oh, no. 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 Oh, Oh, you got him on already. Ah! Uh, 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 you need to have a Don't you kill me? I, I, could, I couldn't get it hooked. Ah! Yeah. Uh, that would be good. Don't kill me. I love you. Luke, his arm's up. Ah! Uh, I'll kill you. Don't think you're good. Ow! 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 Ow!
I got it. Here it is. Get him up on him. Sit, Sit him up. Him up. Oh, get him up. All the way. Yeah, Ruby, hey, don't take that hobble. Hold on to that hobble. Okay. Somebody, my heart's fucking already up, so I can't tell if his is. As long as you get there, medics are on the way. Lay it back, let's do it for real. Yep. Let's get those yep. cuffs off yep. and do it for real. This way. Okay? Get his head tilted, let's do it for real. Get the cuffs off. Now do what you want to do. Thank you. Somebody give me a key. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Get the one off, we'll flip him over on his back, we'll work him. Yep. Okay. And then somebody get that other cup off. Got it. Right. So he can't hit us with it when he wakes up. Hold his head, hold his head, hold his head. Alright, let's do this for real, guys. Can't cover. Tilt it back. Get it over in his mouth. Get it on his mouth. Five and two. Five, five and two. two. Three, four, five, three. Twice. The patient, the patient did die uh, at CPR. They were unable to resuscitate him. Uh, about uh, three years. And this, this video, as, as are all the other videos that I showed today, are available on YouTube. So this is the case definition of excited delirium. Uh, this is from a white paper published by the American College of Emergency Physicians in 2009. Subject are hyperaggressive with bizarre behavior and are impervious to pain, combative, hyperthermic, and tachycardic. There's typically a struggle with law enforcement that involves physical, noxious chemical, or electrical conducted device or taser use, followed by a period of quiet and sudden death. The majority of cases involve stimulant abuse and most commonly cocaine, although methamphetamine, PCP, and LSD have also been described. So this is also from the same white paper. This is a database of about a million police encounters in Canada, including 698 uses of force. And they had 24 patients that had six out of the 10 criteria for excited delirium syndrome. So the criteria that they're proposing are pain tolerance, tachypnea, sweating, agitation, tactile hyperthermia, police noncompliance, lack of tiring, unusual strength, all those 90% or above, inappropriately clothed, 70%, attracted to mirrors or glass, about 10%, I don't think that really helps us. But I think the important thing to note here is that this is clearly, we frequently encounter some patients who have a degree of agitation. And then we see patients who often take it to the next step. And these are the patients who are requiring multiple officers to, uh, to control the behavior. And they often, I mean, the call comes in as behavioral or, or a law enforcement emergency. These patients are often walking into traffic, running around the apartment complex naked, um, breaking, you know, running down the street, breaking, um, breaking car windows. So they present dramatically agitated. And I don't want to suggest that a large number of these patients die, but it has been repeatedly documented that some of these patients die and typically they're very difficult to resuscitate. Um, we've had at least one case that fits some of the aspects of this profile in Clark County. It was in uh, a patient who was banging his head against the wall in the jail. And I do want to note, when this has been studied by the medical examiners, there's not one thing that is responsible for these patients' death. Not the, not the prone position, not um, 
uh, not ne a neck hold, not taser use. It seems that the reason it's defined as a syndrome is that all of these things seem to be going together. And so we'll talk about things that you should document and things that you should use in the management. Um, but if this is something that exists, and it is, it's one of the things that is purely an EMS diagnosis. No one comes into their primary care doctor uh, because they're naked breaking car windows. Um, and very few people make it into the emergency department without contacting EMS first when they're presenting like this. So this is a diagnosis that, uh, that EMS has to own and know how to manage. So it's a medical emergency, but because it's presenting as a behavioral emergency or a law enforcement problem, it requires a coordinated approach with law enforcement. I'm going to step back for a second and talk about the general management of psychiatric disorders, and then we're going to go back and talk more specifically about the management of excited delirium. So general management of psychiatric disorders. In general, what we're doing in the field is we're trying to determine what things are clearly due to a reversible medical cause um, or organic and what things are psychiatric or functional. So things that are organic or due to a medical cause are more likely to be acute than chronic. Uh, they're more likely in patients with no psychiatric history, whereas someone who um, has some psychiatric history uh, is more likely to have a psychiatric problem. Uh, patients with primary medical problem are more likely to have abnormal vital signs versus a primary psychiatric problem that often has normal vital signs. And then patients with an organic cause are much more likely to be disoriented, whereas psychiatric patients are oriented. Um, they, have normal, they can have intact cognition, but they often have a problem with mood or thought process or thought content. So why do we hospitalize people for psychiatric disorders if they're suicidal, if they're homicidal, or if they are gravely disabled, meaning that they're unable to care for themselves because of the degree of their illness? Now, this is not an ultimate determination that we need to make in the field, but if there's a question of one of these things, those are the patients that, um, that we transport so they can be fully evaluated. In the state of Washington, um, although a physician can hold a person to be evaluated by the designated mental health professional for the county, it's only the designated mental health professional for the county who makes the determination to hold against a will for hospitalization. So the pre-hospital decision making, is this excited delirium? And I think that follows a different pathway. And then otherwise, is the patient stable or unstable? Is there a serious is there an underlying serious medical condition? Is there something that requires psychiatric consultation? Meaning, is there a question about suicidality, homicidality, or grave disability? And should the patient be forcibly detained to get that emergency psychiatric evaluation? <laughs> if you move to the stage where you need physical restraint, the principles are that you use the minimum level of restraint necessary but that you have adequate uh, equipment and personnel available for the job. So you obviously don't want to move into a situation like this when it's, I mean, you can see as this guy is starting off contacting this patient, he's, he's by himself. Um, and then he you know, gets some backup and finally gets some other backup, but that definitely makes the situation much more difficult. That said, when, when we talk about the minimum amount of restraint necessary, you, wanna, you don't want to restrain someone, for example, just re restrain one hand and put the patient in a position where he, they can undo that restraint with the other hand. So let's talk about sedation. Because we're recognizing that excited delirium is increasing as a problem, we're going to update the protocols in June. Um, but I've discussed this with Dr. Whitwer. If you feel the need to use this protocol before June, because we see this as a patient safety and a medic safety issue. Um, you can do that before the, the, before the printed protocols are updated. Uh, Multnomah County is doing the same thing because they're recognizing this problem. And so my contention is, if you think back to that video and that call, this is much safer if we rapidly sedate this patient. And so 
if you're finding someone who is in this situation where they're a threat to themselves, a threat to responders, bystanders, you can use five to 10 milligrams of midazolam IM and mixed in the same syringe, droperidol five to 10 milligrams IM. And the, the idea of this is that we're safer off if we get rapid control. This is essentially procedural sedation to allow you to do the takedown. And then you want to put this patient in a situation where they're fully monitored. So cardiac monitoring, pulse oximetry, and tidal CO2. Now, there's no, this, the patient in the video may have died anyway. My contention is that his best chance to make it through this encounter is if we rapidly sedate him and then institute all the physiologic monitoring that, uh, that we can do. It's the prolonged struggle that makes them more likely to, uh, to arrest. Now, if you're not dealing with this completely out of control patient, but someone who's mildly agitated, if you've got a known or suspected psychiatric disorder, then droperidol is the preferred agent. If you don't have that, um, geodon is also an option. You just have the problem of reconstitution. And then if it's primarily a, a, sympath um, a sympathetic overdrive state, so for example, stimulant ingestion like cocaine or methamphetamine, withdrawal from alcohol or benzodiazepines or postdictal, then Versed by itself is the is the drug of choice. Yeah, you could substitute um, geodon for droperidol if uh, if that's what if that's what's available to you. Um, geodon is a little bit slower in onset and um, a little bit longer acting, but we. We understand drug shortages, and we want, we, as, as a medical rec director, you never want to be in the position where you're not giving your personnel adequate tools for the job, and that's our goal with this. We want to make sure that we're keeping everybody safe, um, that we're keeping the patient safe, that we're keeping the medic safe, and, um, and so this is, a, it's the two together have a synergistic effect. Um, the midazolam is fairly short acting, um, on the order of uh, one to two hours. Prepared all can be a little bit longer. Uh, but we understand that some of these patients require sedation, and your best shot is to give them one IM dose of a high, you know, one high IM dose, but then to get them supine monitored as quickly as possible. Other questions about that? No, this is a, this is a, a standing order. So these are the key points that you want to do and document in a situation like this. These are the patients that are unresponsive to verbal de-escalation. They're posing a threat to their safety and or the bystanders or medic safety. And that you're placing these patients with non-constricting restraints, no pressure on the neck or the torso. And again, our goal with rapid sedation in these patients is that it's going to make a prolonged physical struggle unnecessary. And then after you do that, you want to reassess your neurovascular status as best you can in all the extremities that you've restrained. Questions about documentation? So the key take home points from this you want to describe the key abnormality on the psychiatric exam, whether that's a problem of mood or speech or thought process or content. DSM-5 is new this year, um, and there are changes in the way we think about some psychiatric diagnoses as a result of that. Psychiatric hospitalization is for suicidality, homicidality, or grave disability, and we're going to bring in people for emergency evaluation if there's a question of that. And then excited delirium is a medical emergency that requires a coordinated approach with law enforcement. And with that, I'll take any other questions.
that, that's correct. So let me. So the question was, um, when the designated mental health professional has the authority to detain someone against their will, law enforcement also does have that authority. The designated mental health professional has the authority to hospitalize someone against their will, meaning an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. But yes, law law enforcement clearly has the, um, the duty and responsibility to uh, to place a mental health hold if someone's behaving in a, in a manner that threatens themselves or others. I defer a lot of the answer to Drew and to John. Um, law enforcement's responsibility is different than ours. I mean, it, they're, they're, they're obviously looking out for the patient's best interest, but their, you know, assessment of an individual's, our assessment of an individual's ability to be harmed or to be sick or need, they need to be seen. That's, we, we transport patients to the hospital. Law enforcement has to make the determination, are they a danger to themselves? And their assessment of danger to themselves is acute, okay? Somebody leads a poor lifestyle and smokes cigarettes and drinks alcohol and wanders into traffic, well, that's not an acute situation. From a, from a law enforcement standpoint, their assessment is different than ours, and that's the, that's the major difference, and that's where, we, that, that's where we have a sticking point. We did this, I think, three years ago four years ago maybe, and I can't remember who the Vancouver police gal that came in and talked to us about it, but their assessment of danger in a specific situation is completely different than ours. Question. Well, we're getting we're getting into a the medical legal lecture is going to be next month. Um, we're kind of getting off topic a little bit, but the the point is, I mean, in your situation, you do everything you possibly can, and sometimes you got to leave patients like that. I mean, there's, you know, that you consult medical control, you you try and get help from law enforcement, but once again, you need to under we all need to understand is that their approach to a situation like that is as a non-medical professional, okay? Their, their, their assessment of danger is different than ours. And sometimes, sometimes you have to leave patients like that. So um, repeat the question for people at home. The question is, um, does the online medical control have the authority to um, detain a patient by giving that order? And yes, under the physician's authority to detain a patient for emergency evaluation, that doesn't, so I can't order that someone be given inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, but I can order that they be detained for psychiatric evaluation. So to answer your question, number one, if you're in that situation, my first call would be to online medical control. If online medical control says this patient should be taken against, against their will, then I think you're under your authority to do that. I think you also have to make an operational judgment about whether you have the resources to do that safely and what kind of cooperation you have from law enforcement in that situation. 
Uh, the second option that you have is contacting the designated mental health professional through dispatch. Um, they're on they're on 24/7, and you can describe the situation, and they can do and uh, they can also do that. But I think your your best choice is to contact online medical control first. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does very well. Thank you. And Dr. Bell, do you have anything to add to that from the physicians at Southwest? Okay. And so that's just repeating for uh, for people who are listening at home. Uh, Dr. Bell from Southwest uh, concurs, and that's the, the feeling of the emergency physicians at Southwest, is that if there's a question about whether someone can be held against their will, they're happy to take that call as online medical control. Other questions? So on that note, let's take a five-minute break, and then Dr. Bell will be back with case review. Okay, uh, we're going to get started. We're going to do some case reviews. First of all, I wanted to introduce myself for anybody that doesn't know me. I know I know a lot of faces in the crowd here. I am Dr. Marty Bell. I've, uh, I'm an emergency physician. I've been practicing at Southwest for 22 years now. So I've been in the community a long time, and I uh, have a great appreciation for what you all do. Um, I know our environment is challenging sometimes, but I know it's, it's uh, amplified in the field and you have some very challenging situations that you get into that uh, are not for the faint of heart. So uh, Dr. Mock just mentioned uh, a few of the more harrowing situations that come up uh, with behavioral uh, situations. What I'm going to talk about is, is uh, something that should send you out of here feeling pretty good about what you do. Uh, we're living in the age of intervention now and for stroke and STEMI and a lot of surgical conditions, there's uh, some fantastic things that we can do quickly if they're identified. And uh, what you do is extend hospital care into the field and allow us to uh, identify things early on and mobilize uh, uh, specific teams that can intervene rapidly and, and be life-saving or limb-saving. So case one, I got the, uh, the uh, pleasure of, of reviewing these cases this, from this past month. And uh, this was a uh, chest pain call uh, in a 77-year-old male who was uh, obviously in, in some physical uh, distress, uh, complaining of chest pain rating to his abdomen and jaw. And it had been going on uh, two days, uh, getting worse, um, and he was uh, Working in his shop, it got pretty severe. Um, he laid down, uh, but things didn't get better. Uh, he called uh, 911 and um, kind of gave a nondescript uh, complaint there. So initially, his uh, vitals, um, he was awake and alert. Uh, pressure was okay. His uh, rate was okay. Um, 12 lead EKG, which is one of those tools that actually can uh, determine the, um, the direction of the, the care for your patient. Uh, showed some obvious abnormalities. And here we see in the uh, tracing, the 12 lead tracing that uh, is below uh, some obvious ST segment uh, elevation here in the inferior leads, leads 2, 3, and AVF. He's in a sinus rhythm, it appears. You can see P waves, and his rate is controlled. Um, if you look at AVL, there's some ST segment depression there. And so this looks like it's a true reciprocal. If you're looking at the, at the, uh, at the heart, it's on the um, opposite, opposite side. So reciprocal changes, would, which would be consistent with uh, um, a, an inferior wall uh, STEMI. Um, the EKG is an is a imperfect tool, but it is helpful in, in, uh, in our situation in, in, in identifying patients that possibly could benefit from a quick trip to the cath lab. Um, but it can be a difficult thing to interpret sometimes and has to be put into the, into the, uh, into the clinical situation. In this case, uh, his, his uh, 
treatment was started with some aspirin after identifying the, uh, the EKG changes. And um, we put an IV in and uh, hung a bag of saline. And with an inferior wall uh, STEMI, you got to be concerned about whether this is extending into the uh, right ventricle. And they did make mention of a, a V4 R that was negative there. I don't know if we actually got a tracing on this one or not. But they are particularly volume sensitive, uh, and, nit and nitroglycerin or morphine can really dump their pressure um, if you're not um, careful. So we try to uh, not use that in the field, especially if you if you have a, a concern about that. So uh, here. Uh, Got a little bit of saline. Uh, his exam was not indicative of uh, congestive heart failure. His lungs were clear. His mental status stayed the same. His pressure stayed stable. And um, he was uh, transported. Here's some more tracings. So in the hospital, uh, and this is what I can give to you is the hospital follow-up because often, even in the ED, we don't get follow-up on some of our patients, but uh, I'm sure it's more difficult for you also, and this is where it gets pretty fascinating and, and, um, and I think rewarding for the work that you do. In, in the hospital, they get uh, heparin and Plavix, uh, typically uh, that's given before um, they go in with the, uh, the uh, catheter. Uh, emergent PTCA revealed um, RCA, right, right uh, coronary artery and circumflex artery occlusion, and there were three stents placed. He was actually discharged two days after the presentation on Plavix and aspirin, so two antiplatelets, uh, torvastatin, estatin, metoprolol, lisinopril, and, um, and did well. Uh, case two, um, chest pain for two days off and on and, ha and uh, presented with uh, constant uh, central chest pain for 11 hours. So prolonged chest pain in the field. Uh, he thought it was indigestion, which is typical male, you know, kind of everything um, is explained by uh, something that wouldn't, wouldn't do harm. But... Uh, he was found to be sitting on a sofa in moderate distress, ashen, which is always a bad sign. Um, his, uh, let's see, treatment included some early aspirin after this 12-lead uh, electrocardiogram revealed again what looks like uh, some inferior wall ST segment elevation. You can see that there in 2, 3, and AVF. And uh, again, he's in a sinus rhythm. Sinus, uh, his, his rate's a little slower. Still having pain. Blood pressure, 91 over 59. So he's in, you know, his, he's hypotensive at this point. His heart rate is 65. And he's got an inferior wall uh, pattern on 12 liter electrocardiogram. So your concern is here, you don't want to dump his pressure. And staying away from nitro again is probably a good idea in this situation, which was done. He was brought into the hospital, and in the ED, after that prolonged 11-hour uh, episode of pain, his initial troponin was 3.6, so it was already elevated when he came in and actually rose to over 50 in his, over his hospital course. He was, again, given a heparin bolus and some fentanyl. Um, he was actually given some PO, uh, metoprolol, and atorvastatin, and Plavix in the ED on route to the cath lab. And in the cath lab, he had thrombosis of his RCA, the right coronary artery, he had PTCA of a bare metal stent followed by intracoronary nitroglycerin and adenosine uh, to actually restore a TIMI3 flow. And TIMI3 flow is basically normal flow through a uh, coronary artery. They, they graded on uh, the thrombolysis and myocardial infarction study. And um, it's interesting to go to the cath lab conferences and actually see the angiograms. And I'd like to 
do that sometime and actually bring some angiograms to give you a visual uh, representation of what this actually means. But uh, it's all done under fluoroscopy, so you can actually see the contrast going through the, uh, the uh, architecture of the uh, coronary anatomy. He, again, was discharged two days later, so within two days, discharged from the hospital after a major heart attack. This is something 20 years ago that was, um, you know, unheard of. You'd stay weeks in the hospital recovering from things like this. He was uh, actually in instructed by his cardiologist to uh, avoid tobacco and methamphetamine in the future. Case number three, this is a young guy, 51 years old. Uh, this is a great case. This was uh, just very impressive about uh, the care that this guy got. And I don't know if anybody in the room actually took care of this guy, but uh, he was working out and actually uh, had uh, uh, substernal chest pain that radiated down both arms and went to the uh, urgent care clinic at the Vancouver Clinic. Um, he was there and had uh, pretty stable vital signs. Um, and, and bad chest pain, which was uh, totally out of the blue for him. Um, pretty healthy guy by history. Uh, no medical problems on no medications. His 12 lead uh, was, let's see if it's on the next slide here. Twelve lead uh, showed obvious signs of a STEMI. Um, he was given some aspirin and a sublingual nitro by the uh, clinic doctors. Some uh, oxygen and 911 was called. And uh, when they were trying to move him over uh, to the stretcher, he became unresponsive. And as you saw with the tracing that we showed on the next slide, uh, had a V-fib arrest. Um, CPR was immediately started. The uh, patient was ventilated and defibrillated. He had a return of spontaneous circulation and his heart rate after return was uh, slow. So there's the V-fib on the top tracing and the post-shock uh, 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 rhythm. And here's the 12 lead that depicts his uh, area of uh, injury. And as you can see, um, He's got uh, anterolateral ST segment elevation depicted in the precordial leads there and also in uh, leads one and AVL. And you see in the inferior leads, at least leads uh, three and F, you can see reciprocal ST segment depression. So he was uh, awake, not comatose, after the return of spontaneous circulation, largely due to the short time frame in which he had rapid defibrillation. So it saves the muscle, it saves brain. His uh, vital signs there, um, you know, perfusing rhythm. In the hospital, he got heparin nitro dilaudid for pain, amio, bolus, and drip because of his arrest. He got some Zofran. Uh, the cath lab was busy, unfortunately, at the time. He got TNK until he could be taken. I don't think it was too long of a delay until he went to the cath lab and uh, had partial reperfusion already uh, when they cathed him, you know, but found a, a, a Widowmaker 90% stenosis of his LAD. He, was, uh, he underwent angioplasty with a, a drug-eluting stent and um, did well, but post-cath he had some degree of uh, myocardial depression with his EF on echo. So they typically do an echocardiogram to assess the, um, the pump the, the heart muscle and, and how well, especially in an anterior wall where you're dealing with the left ventricle and the eff efficiency with which the pump works, they do a, a EF and 30 to 35 percent is is low and um, may make him a candidate for a um, ICD because of his sudden cardiac arrest. He was discharged with a life vessel, which is I, I, th I don't know if you're all familiar with that. It's an, kind of a uh, yeah, we did you really? Okay, yeah. And I know we've had uh, at least one of the, the pediatric arrests that went home on an, a life vest as well until they could define whether they would need an ICD. So, uh, and that really depends, uh, according to the insurance companies, on whether the, you, uh, you uh, 
recover uh, the, e the uh, left ventricular function enough over the course of three to six months, I think. I'm not sure exactly what the time window is. Do you? But they, um, they reassess at three to six months and determine what your uh, EF is and then whether you're a candidate for uh, ICD or not. So uh, this gentleman was discharged three days after this event. And uh, those are the medications. He had an ACE inhibitor, carvedilol, which because of the heart failure, it's a beta blocker like metoprolol. But uh, they use it more in heart failure patients, Plavix aspirin, atorvastatin, and purine nitro. So he had an amazing uh, outcome based on his near-death experience and, and only because of the rapid effective pre-hospital treatment. Case number four. Uh, this is kind of a wild case and probably kind of fits into Marlowe's territory from his lecture. Uh, he, uh, this was a difficult extraction of a patient. I guess his house is kind of uh, funky with a th uh, 30 foot of homemade stones and very poor access. He was found writhing on the floor of his living room. Anybody take care of this guy? Uh, bystanders were act actively smoking. Plumes of smoke coming. I can just picture this. Plumes of smoke coming out of the windows. Uh, he was having bad pain, it looks like, um, with some other symptoms. He was concerned that he may have a, I don't know, a DVT or PE. Uh, he had self-administered some medications before coming in, and he was a uh, very difficult historian. So as you can see on the 12 lead here, he's got some, some pretty bad abnormalities. He's got some anterior ST segment elevation, um, and uh, he's got some premature beats there. Uh, looks like his underlying rhythm is a sinus rhythm and his rate is not too bad. His blood pressure there initially was 78 over 67, and rate was 70. Um, so he was actually extracted on a sh sheet and moved to a gurney at the bottom of a stone walkway and moved to the ambulance and transported to uh, Southwest. Um, Went straight to the cath lab where he's found to have an acute thrombosis. Now this guy had had previous, uh, previous uh, bypass surgery and he had a Lima left internal mammary artery graft, the LID. They tend to like to use those arteries in candidates because they, they, uh, they last longer and are more effective in, in grafts, especially to the LID, which is the main artery that supports your left ventricle. And so he had an acute thrombosis of uh, his prior lima graft, and the um, internal mammary artery comes off of the uh, comes off of the aorta, just around uh, the uh, the arch uh, where the vertebral arteries come off. So um, he also had uh, native his original left anterior descending, had, uh, which had previously been stented, was also occluded. So he had two areas of concern. His lima graft was aspirated. And the LID was uh, plastied again with, with re restoration of Timmy 3 flow. Uh, he had a saphenous vein graft, which is a vein graft that went to the obtuse marginal. Uh, that's an artery off the circumflex artery, if you remember your coronary anatomy. And um, he had received some Plavix in the ED and was started on Angiomax, which is a, uh, another um, anticoagulant medication while he was uh, getting his procedure done. He was discharged uh, in, in pretty good shape. His, um, his echo was pretty profoundly depressed though with an EF of 15 to 20 uh, percent. So he had a big hit to his um, uh, left ventricle with that, uh, that uh, prolonged pain and um, the, the, the location of the infarct. So these are some examples of, uh, of how you can, you can change the course of a patient and also mobilize a, a team at the hospital with rapid identification with 12 lead electrocardiograms. And uh, it's extremely helpful in differentiating patients that have, uh, have chest pain in the field. I mean, chest pain is uh, one of those diagnoses that can be pretty 
difficult to sort out. I mean, they, there's a, br a broad spectrum of causes that can be involved uh, from musculoskeletal all the way to the vascular emergencies like an acute aortic dissection or, uh, you know, a STEMI or a massive PE, that sort of thing. And then there are other things, inflammatory conditions, myocarditis and, and uh, pericarditis that can confound things. But, you know, being able to differentiate that with 12 lead electrocardiogram. I mean, pericarditis, you know, you, you'd expect more diffuse SD segment elevation, even in myocarditis, you can have a myopericarditis uh, without any reciprocal changes like you saw in some of those uh, representative EKGs. So the data that you have is very helpful initially to kind of sort these out and, and also to, you know, it's very uh, resource uh, heavy um, proposition to get a cath lab team in, especially after hours. So it's important to, to make pretty good um, uh, decisions early on. And, uh, that way we can be good stewards with our resources. So any other questions about or, or comments about these cases that uh, may be helpful for the group? So strong work, thank you. All right, real quick. Um, I know, we're not done yet, sorry. Okay, ALPS inclusion criteria, non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, you need an IV or an, or an IO for these patients to provide um, study drug. Persistent or recurrent VFib, VTAC, pulseless VTAC, after one or more shocks, okay? There's been a couple, case in rec couple cases recently where we've had the um, ALPS drug given at the third shock. Just give it, I mean, at least it's been given, so, but try and give it for recurrent VFib. Okay, one or more, right? No open label IV amiodarone or lidocaine used in the field, so these are exclusion criteria. Known hypersensitivity, it's hard to know, but if somebody has a lidocaine hypersensitivity, those, those may be a little bit more common. Um, if they have the medical alert breaks, et cetera, et cetera. Protected population, prisoners, kids, and pregnant patients, they're out. Um, and then obviously those with no study bracelets. What counts as a shock? A rock agency, an EMS agency gives a shock. First responder, BLS AED gives a shock. Um, ALS delivered a shock. Public access defibrillation shocks. Okay, I know some places like the courthouse, Frito Lay, they have AEDs on site. A lot of churches in town have AEDs on site. If they give a public access shock, that counts. Okay, not internal implanted defibrillator and or, which is kind of neat that Maury brought this up with the life vest, life vest shocks. They don't count as a shock. Um, what is persistent or recurrent is confirmed VFib, pulses VTAC. Um, Pulseless means needing CPR, for those of us who don't understand that. Um, just trying to help you out. Okay, seen any time after the first shock. If you're thinking anti-dysrhythmic, think ALPS, okay? Give drugs as soon as possible within 10 minutes is preferred. You can give it concurrently with epi. If ROSC and then VF, re, VFIT, VF VTAC, pulseless VTAC returns, you can give the remaining ALP syringe if you've already given one dose. Um, if you resuscitate a patient, they have ROSC, then they go back into VFib, VTAC, pick up the protocol where you left it off, okay? Start from there. Just because a patient has ROSC doesn't mean they're wiped out. If they go back into VFib, VTAC, you can pick it up where they were. Um, if persistent VFib, VTAC, after you're done given ALP stuff, um, continue with your normal ACLS protocol after that. I'd say give mag, but does anybody have mag anymore? No. Yeah. You do? Okay. Well, hopefully we all run with Vancouver Fire and Camus. So that'd be good. Um, okay. Important points. We need to use the ClearLink adapter. This is a must. We have to use it. Okay, it's usually best to put the ClearLink adapter on the tubing before you put the syringe in there. 
Um, if the if the pa if you open the box and the syringe is broken, patients excluded from ALPS. And then please call after you enroll. They need to know about these patients. It's pretty important. Um, and then document, blah blah. Upload the CPR process file. Please, very, very important, all agencies, first response or transport, please upload the PCO, the PCO file, okay? And or if you don't have one to upload, document that your other agency you responded with, it was their monitor that we used, okay? So upload the file or document whose monitor was used. Okay, Sud's case, real quick, all patients with pre- has anybody entered anybody in Suds yet? Drawn Suds blood? Yeah, well, you're from Portland. Anybody else? No? Okay, the sudden unexpected death study, right? Um, patients that are pre hospital death in the fields. John, do, have we gotten the most transport agencies should have the vials? Is Cliff here? Yes, we do have. You have them? Okay, do you have them, North Country? No? Do you guys have them? No. All right. Okay, we'll fix that today. Um, okay, all pre-hospital cardiac arrest patients, even if return of spontaneous circulation. Any code 99, draw, it's a purple top, red top tube. Well, actually, I'll show you in a second. I forgot what it was. Exclusion, traumatic or violent deaths, um, overdose, Draw blood as soon as feasible. Hopefully you could draw it right, right as you're starting the IV or the IO. Oh, it's a purple top, sorry. Drop a single purple top, put it in the, in the bag, and then ambulances conveniently have coolers now because we're not carrying chilled saline, so the coolers are in there and they're not full. So put it in the cooler and then transport personnel will contact the um, SUDS agency. So make sure you label the tube with the patient's name, the run number, and the date of service, okay? If you have a copy of the hospital face sheet, please put it in there. Yes, sir. What about a respiratory arrest for ACE and cardiac Yes. Yes. Any codes? Any codes that isn't an obvious death, okay? Um, put it in the baggie, blah, 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 and then in the fridge. That's it. Any questions about suds or outs? Potentially. <laughs>